The, the church at Thessalonica is an amazing church because Paul was there maybe two weeks. He was there three Sabbaths. And if he arrived on a Sabbath and taught for two more and left, that was two weeks. <laughs> and uh, when you read First Thessalonians, he's writing back to them to encourage them and establish them. And you see just how much he covered. They must have been at church all the time. That's all I can tell you. You know, so you think an hour and a half is tough. Well, you, you should have stuck with the Apostle Paul for a little while. I mean, can you imagine getting a Bible college uh, lesson or degree in two weeks, maybe three? Um, that's, some, that's some study there, okay? And, uh, but... This church uh, is an example uh, of what um, a church should be in many, many ways. Um, kind of like the Corinthian church is a example of what a church should not be in many, many ways. <laughs> the, uh, both, both examples, I guess, are good for us, aren't they? And uh, so let's, let's look at a couple of verses from First Thessalonians chapter 1 and we talk about them. So this should be a short lesson. It's only about one or two verses. So, <laughs> All right. Verse 2 says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And that's pretty typical with the Apostle Paul. And uh, we say, well... Uh, it, prayer is one of those things that we embrace by faith. You know, God does, why does God need me to pray about anything? Why can't God just do what he wants to? It's his will to be done. Well, whether you or I understand it or not, God says pray without ceasing. And, uh, and it's a part of the spiritual battle that we face and, and I believe that some way that we can't quite understand uh, God's will is accomplished in this world through prayer in ways that it would not be accomplished otherwise. And I have to take that on faith. And uh, the Apostle Paul was a man who prayed and he says that he was example of the believer of this age. And so if he's praying all the time, I think we need to too. And one of the things that we should be doing in our prayers, and it's really good for us, is giving of thanks. Um, I know this is not November, but you need to count your blessings and do that every day, every often, and uh, because it's important. It keeps us straight, you know, because uh, we read in the Old Testament about God speaking, and sometimes it was in this still, small voice. And I had to listen, okay? Well, sometimes your blessings are whispering to you and your troubles are hollering at you. You need to learn to listen to those blessings that are yours. And don't pay so much attention to the shouting troubles that we have in our lives. But what was... Verse 3 is what we want to, to look at today making mention of human prayers, remembering. So while he's talking about them, he's memoring. He's remembering. <laughs> he's remembering his time there in Thessalonica. He's remembering the people he led to Christ. He's remembering their hunger to know the things of the Lord. He's remembering those things. And uh, those are good memories in the Apostle Paul's life. And here's some, there's three specific things that he mentions here that he remembers about them. And I want you to th consider if anyone that knows you stops and thinks about you, would, they meant, would these three things come to mind when you came to their mind? That's what we need to think about here. Remembering without ceasing, number one, your work of faith, number two, your labor of love, and number three, your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God, our God and Father. Now, um, this is a little um, 
these words here, work of faith. Uh, we're, we're a grace church, and, and, and sometimes we have trouble connecting these two words. Um, by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. You see that there is a separation in the Bible here, faith and works. But if we, re, if we go on down to verse 10, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 10, not, not 1 Thessalonians. Um, verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto or for the purpose of good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we, we see the right progression here. We do not work for God's favor. We do not work for a relationship with God. We do not work to atone for our sins. We do not work to, to buy a relationship with God or get ourselves out of trouble. We do not work for those things. But we, what is it then a work of faith talking about here? I, I think that this is connected uh, in a sense to uh, what, what Jesus in John chapter 5 talked to um, the Jewish people about. When they, they ask him, when he is presenting himself to them as the Messiah, the Savior, and so they are understanding this, this man is speaking, and he's speaking from God. Um, so somebody asks the question, what must we do to work the works of God? That's their mindset. Isn't that in our mindset? Nothing comes from nothing. We've got to work for something. We, we, you know, we have, some of us have, are humble enough to cheerfully, thankfully accept gifts, and some of us, you know, we just choke at that when somebody tries to give us something. We say, well, I've got to do something back now, you know. I've got to somehow even the score somehow. You see, that's the way we tend to think. But this is the work of God, he said to them, that you believe on him who has sent. Believe. It... it Second Thessalonians kind of brings out another idea with this, you know, to obey the gospel. Obey the gospel. So we understand obedience, you know, and Ten Commandments and don't do and, and this do. And we learn that in the home. And so obey the gospel, what does that mean? Well, it, Paul, when he spoke to the jailer in Philippi, he, he told him what to do. This is, this is the work. <laughs> this is what you do. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, I think that, that, that we need to make that connection that, that it is a faith so that it can be by grace and understanding, entering a relationship with God. It's by faith, it's not of works. But Paul here describes and when he begins this progression he begins with the group of gentiles who did not know god and they become children of god and he describes it as a work of faith and uh, and and let's look in the same chapter and, and look over to verse 9 first thessalonians 1 9 all right for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, how that you turn to God from idols. The work of faith here that he is mentioning here is that you turn to God from your idols. That's the work of faith. But, but, it, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what did Paul, what did he have to declare unto them? We well, had to declare unto them the true and the living God, who is the creator of heaven and earth, and has 
showed himself to us, revealed himself to us, the image of the invisible God, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died and rose again, the one who's coming again. This, this is what he taught them from the scriptures. And now, we know that the Greek culture, they worship many gods. Uh, they wouldn't have been much different than the, the, the Athenians when Paul went down to Athens and he found a, a city, a people that were wholly given to idolatry. I mean, they had idols and temples everywhere in the city. And, and that's where he beheld this one idol that, that got him, gave him some sermon material when he went up on, on Mars Hill there. And it was an altar to the unknown God. And so he says, well, I'm going to declare the God you really don't know to you. And, and that's, that's the problem with the world. The Thessalonians, they knew God of their fathers, of their culture. They knew all these gods that had been taught to them. But when Paul came, he says, these are not gods at all. The true God is the creator, and he's not worshipped with hands as though he needed anything. But he's the one who gives us life. And so he, they believed the preaching of Paul about God and the preaching of the gospel. And, and see, there is no... Christianity does not allow for syncretism where we take what we did believe... Let's say you were never worshiping an idol. You never worshiped a false god. You were never raised in another religion. But somehow you had it in your mind that for you to go to heaven, you must, you must go to church. You, you must help other people and live a good life. You, you need to try to keep the Ten Commandments and, and you, you need to... You could just add to the list on, oh, maybe you need to do some ceremonies, whether it's communion or the Lord's Supper or baptism or whatever it may be. You say, I have done those things, and so God will be satisfied with me. That, that is your idol in the sense that that is what you're trusting in. That is your God to save you. And the gospel says those things can't save you. Only Christ can save you. And so the work of faith is to let go, <laughs> you know, and trust God. Now, that's not easy for us sometimes, is it? I mean, even with the witness of the Holy Spirit in our lives, sometimes that's difficult, you know. I, I hear people talk about easy believism, and, and real believism is not easy. It's, it's not easy for us. And the older we get, the harder it gets, doesn't it? When somebody says, trust me, what's the first thing you do? <laughs> I don't trust you. <laughs> you just said, trust you. I, no, I don't trust you any longer. You know, that's what life does to us, right? And so this man, Paul, comes to this city, and they've never heard this before in their life, and he says, I want you to believe what I say. And there's somehow there's this unseen witness of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of these people, and they respond and they believe. It was a work of faith. Can you imagine, um, have you ever done this? My dad this, did this to me. I probably, I know I've did this, I have done this to my children. Um, the dad, at some point, picked me up when I was a little boy, little bitty boy, and he put me on top of the refrigerator. And he says, jump. How many has had something like that happen to you? Okay, all right. All right. They do, uh, they, they do seminars and stuff or trust in a group, don't they? They, they have you stand up and, and fall back and your team will catch you, you know? You go, right, right. That's, that's faith. And when we're a little child, we've got to let go of the refrigerator, and believe that daddy's going to catch us. 
And you've been, and people in this world, they've been holding on to good works, and they've been holding on to this religion, and this idol, and this God, and, and these things, they've been holding on to them, and the gospel says, let go. It says, let go. Okay, that's faith. That's what faith is. And that's a work of faith, that they turn to God from idols. Are you trusting in yourself or some other God, other God, some, something, other religion, some other way to be righteous before God? Then Jesus Christ alone, well, then you need to let go. Just let go and trust Christ. He alone can save. When they trusted him, well, then they, they, what followed the work of faith was a labor of love. Now this, this is important, and you, when you look over to uh, verse 9 again of chapter 1, you see that um, to serve the living and true God. You see, that's the labor of love. Love is a response. We love God, why? Because He first loved us. It's God's the initiator in all of this. He's the one who sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. He's, he's the one that has sent his spirit into the world through his children to proclaim the good news. God is the one who wants us to be in his family. It's God who is the one reaching out. And when we respond in faith to the love of God, then we become the children of God, and then there should be some labor. Okay? You know, uh, love is a verb, it's active. It's not just words. And so, if we love him because he first loved us, then, then it shows. And, and the main thing God wants from you, he just wants you to yield to him. He says, I bought you, and uh, I want to use you in this world. And, and, and when we read the scriptures, we find out, well, I was created for his glory, for his pleasure, and, and, and I have been purchased out of the slave market of sin to glorify Him on this earth. And if I learn to love God, well then it will be demonstrated in my life, serving Him. Now, there's all kinds of ways to serve Him, isn't it? But the, the, the problem about this is that there's really no way of serving God without getting involved in the lives of other people. That's the drawback there, isn't it? Okay, if I could just go in a monastery and lock myself in and just sing to God and read the scriptures, that would be wonderful. But, but that's not why God left you here. If God just wanted to have sweet fellowship with you, he would yank you right into heaven right now. And, and a lot of us are ready to go, aren't we? <laughs> We're ready. Yank us. All right. But he says, no, this world needs Jesus. And so if you love me, well, he told his disciples, love one another, keep his commandments, all kinds of things, didn't he? But if we love, Paul demonstrated, he showed that love. It, it's, it, it's no longer me living, but Christ living in me. He is more important than I am. And that's the reality. It just needs something. It's something that love will produce in my life. Lord, you are more important than I am. And so we, we look at our checkbook and we look at our schedule, our calendar, our day timer, all those things. And we say, how, how much do I love God? And we look at there and say, well, God, I love God a little bit. Because <laughs> God gets a little bit of my time. He gets a little bit of my talents. He gets a little bit of my material blessings. Well, God wants, he's purchased you. He just wants you. And he knows when he's got you, everything else comes along with it, doesn't it? It's a package deal. But um, it's good for us. I mean, it's, we cannot, we can never, you know, it's like Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. And I say, well, if, you know, if I work real hard and I get involved, I, let's say, think of the, what if I worked in the nursery? Every Sunday, every Wednesday, every... Uh, what if I worked in the nursery? That would surely get me 
even with God. That's about the toughest thing I can think of. <laughs> no, I can never get that. And it's not what it's not about getting even with God. It's about God giving you ways, letting you. This is for your blessing, showing you, giving you opportunities to love Him. And that's the joy of it. That's the joy of it. You know, if you're in a relationship with somebody you love and they love you, you know, that's a great thing. There can be no greater relationship, love relationship, than you and, and God. Your labor of love. Serving the living and true God. And then this is the, this is the part that's been brought to home afresh for me yesterday. I mean, we were, Corey's supposed to be home, or back to the airport. The plane's supposed to land about 6. And... Um, it was supposed to land at this hangar. We went to that hangar and they said, no, that's the wrong hangar, it's that one. So the address was wrong. And then we find out more and more that time is wrong. Well, it's not going to be, it may be 8 and maybe 8.39, 9.30, the flight comes in from Texas, you know. And, uh, but it just added to the anticipation. And it was fun watching uh, Melissa. She was just, she says she hates to wait. And you could see it was true. She hated, she was just, you know, hey, are you standing around? I mean, uh, and, and something wonderful is about to happen, you know, something you've been waiting for. Well, patience of hope. Hope is our future in Christ. It's what God has promised. And the, and the, the problem is this in the future is not now. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I've picked up on this culture here. I want it now. <coughs> or yesterday would be better, you know? That's the way we, we, we tend to be sometimes. Yeah. I do deserve it, don't I? Yeah. Okay. But, but God says patience of hope. That's, that's being, finding the grace and the strength to wait not give up, not throw it away, but wait. I will wait upon the Lord. And, and, and we will wait for Him to come and fulfill His promises in our lives. Chapter 1 verse 10 says, To wait for His Son from heaven. That's the patience of hope. Lord, you, you said you were coming back. Where are you? Lord, I've given you this request. I need it now. And we have to wait. We have to wait. And Paul says, you know, I, when I remember you guys, I remember your patience of hope. The Thessalonians, like many of the first century churches, they were persecuted churches. It was hard to say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Boom, 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 boom. You know, or you're fired. Get out of here. Maybe by the grace of God and the mercy of God, we'll, before he comes back, we'll all get to see what that's like here in America. Maybe. But they just demonstrated their confidence in God that they would wait. Jesus said he's coming. And there's nothing that can keep him from coming. The trumpet will sound. And the dead in Christ will rise. And we who are alive in Christ will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The mortal will put on immortality. This corruptible will put on incorruption. That's the promise of God. And God says, that's a blessed hope. That's a hope that brings joy. It's a hope that brings strength. It's a hope that keeps us going. You think of many people who would not need uh, some encouragement to keep going than, other than someone like the Apostle Paul who suffered, suffered, suffered. What are you going through? What are you struggling with? Jesus is coming back for you and it will be worth it. It will be worth it. Whatever your struggles are, Stay true to Him. Stay close to Him. Trust in Him. Rejoice in that hope. 
Jesus is coming again. Let's pray. Father, we